It's still prim primarily English speaking. Um, it's a lot more like <coughs> it's a lot more like the Caribbean than it is Latin America. Um, my wife and I we've been there for about 14 years, and um, as Aaron mentioned, we're kind of in the process of adopting a, a quiver full of children. It seems like we have. We went down there with one. We have four now. Um, one little boy, he's six, Isaiah, his adoption, we got him when he was eight weeks old. It was kind of a crazy story. His mom was bipolar, and she tried to kill him. She tried to cook him alive in an oven, and somebody in his village rescued him. And so we got him as an infant, and um, just like three months ago, his adoption was finally completed. And so that's just been such a, such a blessing. Um, we have another little girl, Eva, who's two and a half. And some of you guys may remember the story. We got her. The mom had approached us, asked us to adopt her. We were in the room when she was born, took her home. Shortly after, the mom changed her mind and decided she wanted the baby back, which was devastating for us. And then a couple months later, on Mother's Day, the mom calls us, hey, I, I can't take this girl. Do you still want her? And so we said, yeah, of course. So, so we have little Eva, and um, her adoption was supposed to be completed last month, but it got a little delay. So hopefully in July, that's going to be completed. And we have a, a third little boy that just came to live with us about a year ago, Darwin. And um, he also is, uh, by end of summer, we're hoping that's going to be done. So that's kind of where we are with our adoption stuff. Um, as was kind of mentioned in the video there, Belize, is, it's a really a, a high crime area. I think last year it was, it was number six in the world for murders. And, um, and this year has just been the craziest year that I can remember, every year. Crime has gone up since we've been there for 14 years. But just this last year has just been crazy. A couple of years ago, um, Belize City was the murder capital of the world for cities its size. And we're right in the, really right in the worst spot. We're, we're right across the street from the main Crip gang, the South Side gangsters. And so all this stuff is going on around us all the time. <coughs> we have a young boy, Elroy, who... Um, 12 years ago when we first started the church in this area, he would come to church all the time. His, his little brother and his little sister came, his mom came. And um, his older brother was, was involved in gangs and um, he was one of the, the guys who, who, he was the shooter for his gang. And so this young boy, Elroy, he kind of was starting to get sucked into to gang activity and stuff. And um, maybe two or three years ago, he got shot twice. Uh, he got shot in the leg and in the butt and then a year later, so he got shot in the arm. But he's getting he's getting pretty heavily involved in all this stuff, and um, and he was he was actively involved in shooting people as well. And about two weeks ago, allegedly anyway, he um, he shot a guy on this basketball court, and there were plenty of people around who were witnesses, but nobody would testify against him, so they released him. And this was on like a Saturday. That Thursday, he was attending a funeral, and one of the guys in the gang came and and shot this young man 16 times. And this is a kid who, who grew up in my church. You know, I knew him when he was a little kid. He would, him and his sister would come and, and help my wife clean the bathrooms, you know? And he was involved in, you know, the, the junior high youth ministry in his first year or two in high school before he started getting sucked into that stuff. And, uh, and it's just really been, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking for, for, for me, just knowing the kid. It was heartbreaking because I, you know, I know his mom well, and, and we're friends, and his little brother is, is my 15-year-old son's best friend. And so it was just, it was just devastating. And, and just, just thinking about this a little bit, because I have a, another set of guys at church who, who basically grew up with, with Elroy, uh, Akeem and, and, and Chris and this other set of kids, and, and they're, they're involved in church, they're involved in ministry. One of them's on staff right now. And I was just thinking about these boys who grew up together, who all had the same opportunities, really mostly the same influences, and, and, and their lives just went such vastly different directions. And I was just thinking, what, what was the difference? What, 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 what makes my guys who are solid leaders good, solid Christians? And why do the other ones fall away? What, here's the question. What are the most important characteristics 
of a successful Christian. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at this morning. What are the most important characteristics of a successful Christian? Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we, as we open your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts, Lord. That you would touch us, that you would minister to us, and that we would hear from you. We ask that in your name. What are the most important characteristics of a successful Christian? I think that's a, that's a pretty loaded question. I think first we need to define what a successful Christian is. And I think that there's, in the world, there's a lot of different criteria that are, are used to, to gauge success, right? Generally, it's things like wealth your position, influence, power, relationships, possessions, bank accounts, boats, vacation homes, how many zeros you have in your bank account, all these kind of things. These are generally what, what, what people use to, to define success or, or a lack of success. And sadly, a lot of those criteria are used to determine if a Christian is successful, if a believer is successful in, in their Christian walk. You know, a lot of times we'll use the same criteria to judge a ministry or a minister. You know, if you're in a ministry, how big is your church? How big is your annual budget? How, how, how much influence do you have in your community? How many campuses do you have as a church? How many people do you have on staff? You know, we, we use these worldly criterias to judge spiritual matters. And I don't believe that God uses those same criteria to gauge our success in our Christian life or in our ministries. Remember in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is giving this illustration. And, and, and at the end he says, you know, in the end, the Father is going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. And what I want to point out is that Jesus is revealing that there are successful and unsuccessful Christians. He's pointing out the possibility of being a successful or unsuccessful Christian in God's eyes. So we see that there's some standard, right? If there's servants who do it and it's well done, there's obviously servants who do it and they didn't do it well, right? They failed. God has some standard by which he judges our success in this life. And I spent some time just thinking this through and trying to define, kind of in my own words, what a successful Christian is. Trying to boil down the essence of spiritual success. And I came up with a couple thoughts. The first thing is this. A successful Christian is one who becomes exactly who the Lord wants them to be. One who becomes exactly who the Lord wants them to be. You know, it's not whether you're a, in full-time ministry or you're a pastor of a successful church or whether you appear to be impacting the world in amazing ways. The question is, are you faithful to what the Lord has called you to do? Have you become the man or woman who the Lord has called you to be? And it doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's evangelizing Tibet or cleaning the church toilet, whether it's being a missionary or, or praying for missionaries, it's, did you fulfill God's plan for your life? That's the criteria. And, 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 and that fleshes itself out. It, it looks different in each one of our lives. But the question is, did you do what you were supposed to do? Did you fulfill your calling? Did you fulfill your ministry? I think that there are a few different characteristics that add up to a successful Christian life. And, and, and whatever your calling is, I think that these few things are, are key. And it isn't being a, a, a dynamic speaker it isn't being a, a, a gifted worship leader. It isn't being, it isn't any of those things. 
It isn't having power and influence. It isn't knowing how to, how to talk and dress and act like a Christian, right? right? And, and I think as we zero in on this, there's a number of things that we could talk about. But I want to zero in on three things that I think are among the most important. And it's certainly not an exhaustive, complete list. But I look at the three things that I think are the most important characteristics or attributes of a Christian. And without these three characteristics, you will never be who the Lord wants you to be. You need to have a servant's heart, a disciple's heart, and a holy heart. And so we're going to look at each three of these. Being a servant. The Greek word is doulos. And I don't, I don't know Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not that smart. I'm smart enough to read people who are smart, right, and, and, and discern from them. So we have this word doulos, and it's typically translated servant in the New Testament. But it doesn't mean servant in, in the sense that we think. When we think of a servant, we typically think of, you know, a maid or a butler or maybe somebody who's, who's coming to, to serve your table at a restaurant. Somebody who, if they don't like their job, they can quit and go be a landscaper or go sell cars or, or something else. But that's not the sense in this word. This word doulos, it means to be a slave. It means to be completely owned by another person. What is a slave's job? A slave's one job is to do whatever the master says to do. And I think of um, one of my favorite movies when I was a kid was Forrest Gump. Remember Forrest Gump? He, he ends up in boot camp. And remember the, the drill sergeant's yelling at him. He says, Gump, what's your sole purpose in this man's army? Remember what he says? Do, do whatever you tell me to do, drill sergeant. Remember? And, and I love that because, I mean, that's, that's our answer. What's our sole purpose as Christians? It's to do whatever the Lord tells us to do. Paul is talking in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. And he's talking about this idea of being a servant. And he says, he, Jesus, gave up his divine privileges. Most of these verses, by the way, are out of the New Living Translation. He gave up his divine privileges, and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Now think about that for a second. This is God we're talking about. The one who spoke creation into existence. He gave up his divine privileges. He laid aside his divine privileges. Theologians call this the kenosis. That's the Greek word for emptying. They call it the emptying. He emptied himself of his power and his position and laid it aside. You remember watching old Western movies or maybe old Western cartoons? You know, there's the sheriff wearing his white clothes and the bad guy comes rolling in dressed in black and, 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 and there's a little confrontation, that, confrontation and the bad guy will say, well, if you weren't wearing that badge, I, you know, and the sheriff will take the badge off and he'll set it to the side. He's, all right, now it's just man to man. I'm not the sheriff anymore. Right? That's the idea. He, he laid aside his authority. Jesus laid aside his position and humbled himself and took the position of a slave. And we're called to do the same. He gives us the example. And Jesus tells the disciples in Mark chapter 10, verse 42, he says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And authorities flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be a slave of everyone else. For even if the Son of Man came not, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, look, in the world, leaders exercise their authority. Right? Most of us all, we've worked for other people. Your boss always lets you know who's boss, right? And that's just kind of how it is in life. We're rulers make sure everybody knows. We're, we've been going through Acts in, um, in, our, in our church. And we're right at the end of Acts where, where Paul 
he's, he was sent, he's under house arrest in, in Caesarea Maritima, and he's, he's in front of Agrippa and um, Festus. And it says, it, Luke makes special note that when Festus and Agrippa and his wife came in, there was great pomp, and there's all this ceremony, and, and all the guards are there, and they're full regalia. And it's this big red carpet affair. They want everyone to know who's the leader, right? They're, they're making sure that they're, they're elevated, they're lifted up, that they're treated a certain way. And we see that today, don't we? Among celebrities and rulers. I mean, red carpet events, and you know, and, and, and celebrities and stars, they're deeply offended if they're not treated just right, right? If their water's not a certain temperature in their room, and, and this and that, and they throw temper tantrums. Jesus says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, if you want to be a leader in God's kingdom, you must become the servant of all. Whoever wants to be number one has to become a slave to everyone. Now, in our way of thinking, that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Jesus says, the Son of Man, the Messiah, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to others. And remember, we're looking at Jesus here. This is God in the flesh. John chapter 13. What do we find him doing? He's washing the disciples' feet. And you have to understand in this culture that we're talking about, washing the feet was the job of a slave, but not just any slave. It was the job of the absolute lowest slave in the household. Washing feet was absolutely humiliating. It was the worst thing that you could have to do in that culture. And Jesus, he willingly strips down to his undergarments and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And, and I mean, this, this culture is... You can't even begin to imagine how modest they are, right? The men won't even run because they don't want their tunic to flip up and people to see their legs, right? And, and he strips down to his undergarment. It's his underwear. Jesus strips down, not to make a joke of it, but he strips down to his whitey tidies, right? And he's there scrubbing these disciples' feet, doing the most humiliating, abased job that there is, setting the example for all of us believers for all time. And of course, I don't believe that we're all called to strip down to our underwear after church and wash each other's feet. But he does give us this, this principle. Right? He shows us, he gives us an example of how to view other people. Paul talks about this in the introduction to his letter to the church of Rome. He says, I, Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He realized that he was a slave. There's this idea that, that he was not his own, that his life belonged to another. Right? The servant's job was to do whatever the master commands. I read one scholar who said that the word doulos speaks of one whose will is swallowed up in the will of another. And I love that. I think that's very, very powerful, very poignant. He says, one whose will is swallowed up in the will of another. The obvious question for us, church, has your will been swallowed up by the will of God? Has your will been swallowed up by the will of God? If not, you're not a doulos. You're not a servant of God. And that's, that's the opposite of the world's view of success, isn't it? Matthew 25 again, Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. A faithful servant. What does it mean to be faithful? It means to be reliable. It means to be trustworthy. I think of Joseph in the Old Testament. Right? He was reliable. Think of him in Potiphar's household. 
He was trustworthy. Even in the face of temptation, in the face of trials and great difficulties, he is one who always did the right thing. And I think that that's the mark of a true servant of God. They're a man or woman of their word. They, they're reliable, they're faithful, they're trustworthy. Someone once said this. They said, do you know what a good way to measure if you have the heart of a servant? He said, how do you respond when you're treated like a servant? And, and you know, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a missionary, and I'm in a kind of, I mean, not to say weird, I'm kind of in a high-profile area. A lot of people know us because we're in this crazy area. And I come up, and people are, oh, you're such a blessing, Pastor. Oh, you're doing such a good, yeah, thank, thank you. It's, it's the Lord, you know. And, and it's easy to be humble and, and all that when, when people are praising you. But when people are back in Belize, and they don't, they don't care what you're doing, and they take advantage of you, and they walk all over you and hurt you, how do you respond then? Do you demand your rights? Do you get indignant? Or do you say, I'm, I'm a servant. I guess I should expect to be treated like a servant. There's this guy in Los Angeles, and um, he's a Catholic priest. His name is Father Greg Boyle. Some of you guys may have heard of him before. He, um, he works in East L.A. with, with ex-convicts and ex-gang members. And he has this organization called Homeboy Ministries, or Homeboy Industries. And they, like, they have different factories where they do bakeries and they sew pants and do landscaping. Just different things to get these, these people who are on, kind of on the down and out back on their feet and working again. And uh, Anderson Cooper came to, to interview Father Greg. And, and they're talking and stuff. And, and Anderson said, aren't you afraid that, that these guys are going to take advantage of you? And, and, and he gave this response that when I heard it, it just, it stuck with me. And it was years ago that I heard this, and it just, it's never left me. Anderson said, aren't you afraid they're going to take advantage of you? And Father Greg said, no one can take advantage of me. Because I've already given my advantage away. And, and, and I think that, man, that's, that's the heart of a servant of God right there. The second trait I want to look at is being a disciple. The word is mathetes, and it means a follower or, or a student. And I think the implication with that word is, is teachability, being teachable. And as a pastor and as one who does you know, training and purposefully raising up leaders in the church, I don't think I can overemphasize the importance of this, of teachability. You can't be a disciple if you're not teachable. And I'm afraid you might have just heard me say, you won't be a good disciple if you're not teachable. That's not what I said. I said you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you're not teachable. Because that's the defining mark of discipleship, being a follower, being teachable, receiving from the master. If you're not teachable, then you're not a follower. I, um, I do this MMA training thing with some of the guys at, at our church. And, uh, you know, Aaron does CrossFit, and I actually, I play real sports. I don't have time for that, but um, I'm sorry, Aaron. Um, so, so, so we've got quite a few guys at church, and uh, it's kind of a ministry, this outreach thing. We've got like, like 30 people on our team, and, and, and I, I do the conditioning and the, uh, the wrestling portion. We have a Muay, guy, Muay Thai guy who comes in and stuff. But So anyway, we have this guy who comes in sometimes. And he hasn't come in in a long time. His name's Ed. And, and Ed comes in, and every time we're, we're drilling a move or something, we're working a new technique, he already knows it. He's seen it on YouTube. Right? And he doesn't want to drill with us. He doesn't want to work anything else. All he wants to do is show us this way that he saw to do it and how to improve it and this other move. And, and he's totally unteachable. And because he's unteachable, he doesn't learn anything new. And he never progresses. And, and this particular guy, I mean, he's athletic enough. He probably could have been a fighter. He could have been okay. But instead, he just, I don't know what he does. But, 
but it boiled down to having an unteachable heart, being prideful. He had this idea that I already know everything. I don't need to learn anything else. Amen. Pride. That was the great sin of Satan, wasn't it? Solomon says this. Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. What Solomon says there is the wise man is marked by the attitude of teachability. He's willing to learn the will of God. He'll listen to instruction. Solomon says in Proverbs 10, 8, the wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their faces. I'm not going to read them all because I'm short on time a little bit, but I've got a whole bunch of great verses from Proverbs. Let me read two more. To learn, you must love discipline. It's stupid to hate correction. Proverbs 12, 1. Proverbs 13, 18. If you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. In order to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to receive correction and instruction. And I think that these two things, correction and instruction, they come primarily from two sources from the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Paul says the Word of God teaches us. It corrects us when we're going astray. It helps guide us back to the right path. Secondly, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit. The moment that we, that we give our lives to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, he indwells us. He takes up residence inside of us. And from that moment on, he begins to guide us and to direct us in righteousness. The Word of God directs us externally, and the Holy Spirit directs us internally, teaching us, correcting us, convicting us of sin. Jesus says in John 16, 13, However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. Remember Acts chapter 7. The crowd has gathered around Stephen. The Pharisees are there, some of the priests are there, and they're they're questioning him, and they're getting ready to execute him. And Stephen gives this sermon. He proclaims the name of Jesus. And at the end, he's just about done. They're just about ready to kill him. And verse 51, he says this. And I like how the King James translates it. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Stephen says, listen guys, the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you something. The Holy Spirit's trying to move. He wants to reveal something to you. But you're so stubborn, you're so stiff-necked that you refuse to listen. I, um, I used to have this dog. I think I might have shared this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because it's a good story. Um, I used to have this dog, and he was, he was about eight months old. He was um, half bull mastiff and half rottweiler. Beautiful dog. Giant head, muscular, dumb as a rock. Dumb, dumb, dumb. And, and I have German shepherds usually, and German shepherds are smart dogs. You want to teach them to walk on a leash, you know, and you put them on there, and they kind of scoot on their butt for about 20 feet, and then they, they hop up and they start walking. This dog, I decided I was going to teach him to walk on a leash. And he started doing the dragging thing. So I said, I'm, okay, I'm just going to keep dragging him. Finally, I dragged him back and forth up my block. Finally, he fell over, and he's, he's just like laying in a ball. And I said, i got to stop dragging. This dog's going to die before he'll learn to walk on a leash. 
And so I let him rest for a little while. I put him back on the leash again. And his tongue's hanging out of his mouth. And he's doing all this weird. That, that literally, he would have died before he learned to walk on a leash. And, and the thing was, learning to walk on a leash was going to be a blessing for him, right? He was going to get to go down to the ocean and go swimming and go for walks, get out of the yard. But he was so stubborn and stiff-necked that he never got to experience those blessings that I was going to give him. That's how a lot of us are. We're unteachable. And because we're unteachable, we miss out on the blessings of God. Are you unteachable? Do you refuse correction? Do you refuse to listen to instruction? I think that's one of the worst traits in a servant of God. To be successful in God's kingdom, you have to have a heart that's teachable and open to what he's telling you. Having the heart of a servant, the heart of a disciple, and having a heart of holiness. The Greek word for holiness, as most of you guys probably know, is hagios. That word hagios, it's a, a word that we're pretty familiar with. It's the root word for holy, for sanctified, for saint, a, a number of kind of key Christian words. And the key idea, of course, to this word is, is being set apart, being sacred. Right? In the temple there in Jerusalem, right, they had all kinds of special instruments for sacrifice, right? They had the special tables and knives and plates and bowls. The priests didn't borrow those on the weekend to go home and have a barbecue, right? They're, they're set aside for, for something special. They're sanctified. I, I see this in Belize. Uh, every school, the kids all wear uniforms. And so they get up in the morning, they, they put their crisp uniform on. It's all ironed and pressed. They go home, they come home for lunch, and first thing they do is they take off their uniform before they eat their food. They go back to school, they put it back on. As soon as they get home, they, they strip that uniform right back off. They're not out playing football, soccer with their, with their uniform on. They're not climbing trees. They're not doing any of that because if they do and their mom catches them, ooh, it's going to be a swift-handed discipline. Right? Because those uniforms are, are set aside for a special purpose. They're for one thing and one thing only. And that's, that, that's sort of the aspect of, of this word hagios that I'm talking about. It was they're, they're set apart, created for a special purpose, not for common use. And another aspect of it is, is being clean, without stain or blemish. Now, imagine you have a white tablecloth on your dinner table at home. Once in a while, my wife, not white, but she'll set out tablecloths. Now I have four kids, three boys. By the time dinner's over, there's juice, there's food, there's a good chance there might be a little blood. There's, I mean, it's, it's, it's defiled by the time dinner's over. It's, it's unholy at that point, right? And that's sort of the idea. Being holy is being without spot, without blemish. William Barclay said, holy means different from the world because it is like the Lord. It's not just being set apart from the world, but it's being set apart for service to God. And, and, and the opposite of holy, you know, we automatically say unholy. But what does that mean, really? It means common. The opposite of holy is common, everyday, worldly. Sinful. Sin separates us from experiencing the presence of God. Sin separates us from all that the Lord has for us. That better be Jesus. Sin builds a barrier between us and God. You know, imagine you've got a best friend, right? And you guys have a fight, whatever, right? You squabble over, I don't know if it's girls squabble over wearing the same shoes to the, I don't know what it is girls fight over, but, you know, anyway, imagine two girls have a fight, 
right? And they've got this issue, this argument. They don't stop being best friends because of that. But there's an issue between them that has to be resolved before that relationship can be fully functional and, and reconciled again. And, and that's sort of like our relationship to God in that when, when, when we sin, we don't stop being a child of God. But that access to God is it's impaired until we deal with that sin and until we repent. Our sin doesn't change our position in God's family. We're, we're saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. Right? It's, it's not that our salvation hinges on our performance by any means, and I don't want to imply that. But our personal holiness does impact our, our, our relationship and our, and our closeness, our fellowship with God. But there's two aspects. Of our, of our holiness. There's positional holiness and practical holiness. Positional holiness, sometimes called justification, just means that when we become a child of God, all of our sins are forgiven. Past, present, future, right? The Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, right? When, when Jesus Christ died for us, our sins were, were destroyed, removed. When God the Father looks down from heaven and he sees me, he doesn't see me in my depravity and brokenness and wretchedness. He sees me through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he sees me as perfect. But there's also practical holiness. And, 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 and that, that involves us setting ourselves apart. Being sanctified. Being different from the world. Holiness denotes that we are, what we are separated to and also what we're separated from. Jesus says in John 17, you're in the world, but not of the world. What does that mean? That we're in the world, not of the world. And in Belize, there's a, there's a lot of Mennonites. You'll be out on a highway out in the jungle, and in the distance, there'll be a horse and buggy. And there'll be an old white guy with a long beard and homemade pants. Right? And they're, they're full on like Amish Mennonites. And um, I was talking to one one day about this. And I said, well, why is it that you guys don't use electricity or anything like that? And, and he said, he quoted this verse. He says, it's because we're in the world, but we don't want to be of the world. I thought, well, is, is, is running water from Satan? You know, is, I, I don't understand it. But, but, and I know this other guy, he's an independent Baptist pastor. And independent Baptists are, are like probably the most ultra-conservative branch of Christianity. I mean, if a woman goes to church wearing pants, she's probably leaving church and going straight to hell. I mean, that's, they're very strict. And, and there's a lot of rules. You have to wear a certain t suit and tie and all this. And, and that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about holiness. It's not as though God responds to us better on Sundays because, because we have a suit and tie on. And it's not because he responds to us better because we don't. He's looking for servants. He's looking for followers who have undefiled hearts, not how well-pressed our, our clothes are. He isn't impressed that you dress up for church. He isn't impressed that you don't dress up for church. You know, it's Calvary Chapel. You know, it's kind of funny. A, a lot of... A lot of other denominations will kind of look down on us because of the way we dress, because we're casual, right? I'm kind of dressed up for my church. I, I, I pretty much only wear flip-flops at church, and just kind of, we have a real casual church. And a lot of times people will look down on us. But you know what's funny? We kind of do the same thing to other people. We judge people who are too dressed up. Ooh, look at them. They think they're, oh, look how spiritual they think they are. And we judge their hearts just like they judge our hearts. And you know what? None of that matters to God. He doesn't care, care how we look, how we're dressed. It's a matter of the heart. And there are some very strict Christians who say you can't watch TV, you can't watch movies, you can't listen to secular music. Is that a good idea? I mean, I'm not getting crazy, but man, it might be for some of us. Some of the stuff that we allow into our lives 
some of the trash that we watch on TV, that we see on the internet, the violence, the sexuality, what happens sometimes is we become desensitized to that stuff. And we don't even notice it anymore. I have a friend, this guy from El Salvador, Oscar, and he's a welder. And um, he's always doing little things where our cars are always breaking down. So instead of buying new parts, let's have him patch them up. And I remember a while ago, he was welding something, and he let it cool down for a little while, and he picked it up, and he handed it to me. And he handed it to me, and I, it burnt my fingers, and I dropped it. And he's holding it, and he's messing around with it, and it's not even affecting him at all. But as soon as I touched it, and it scorched my hands. But because he was always handling that stuff and messing around with it, he had these thick calluses on his hands, and he didn't even feel it anymore. He was desensitized to it. And that's what happens to us. When we as Christians expose ourselves to sin, when we're engaged in things that we shouldn't, when we're watching things and listening things and doing things and smoking things that we shouldn't be, we start to get spiritually callous. And we no longer feel that touch, that conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as we're talking about holiness as we close, I, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about some kind of pharisaical holiness where it's all external, making sure that you look the right way and dress the right way and say the right things, making sure that everybody around you thinks that you're, you know, a lot of times that's what we think of as holiness. Like, I, I got to make sure and put up the right front and know when to raise my hands, and as long as I say amen at the right time, I'm good, I'm in. But that's not the kind of holiness that we're talking about. We're talking about a real, genuine holiness that has far less to do with appearances and more to do with, with the purity of our hearts before God. Is your heart pure before God? Or is it calloused and dirty and stained from your interactions with the world? Is your heart defiled by the secret sins that you keep hidden away from everyone else, thinking that no one sees? He sees. Those things cause a division between you and the Father, between you and your Father. And they're causing you not to become all that he desires you to be. They're causing you to become unsuccessful in your Christian walk. Sin kills. It destroys. It's like a cancer. If you get cancer, what do you do? You shoot it with radiation. You cut it out. You do whatever it takes. You chop it off. You, you destroy it before it destroys you. You're ruthless with it. That's how we need to be with sin in our lives. We have to deal with the sin in our lives, lives ruthlessly. We have to be merciless when it comes to dealing with sin. We have to protect that holiness in our lives. And to be clear, I'm not talking about holier than thouness. I'm not talking about self righteousness. Look at me, I, I keep all the rules. And that's that. Self-righteousness is disgusting in the eyes of God. That's not what we're talking about, being a rule keeper. And the trouble with self-righteousness is this. When, when you are able to keep all the rules, all of a sudden you start, ooh, look at him. God doesn't like him as much as he likes me. Ooh, I'm, God sure is blessed that I'm on his side. And when we fail, God doesn't like me anymore. I'm not even a Christian. And we, start, right? and we start feeling condemned, not understanding grace. And that's not what I'm talking about, being self-righteous and keeping the rules. I'm talking about having a pure heart before the Lord and becoming all that he desires you to be. So those are the three traits, three of the traits, probably not all, but three traits for a successful believer having the heart of a servant, considering others better than yourself, having your will swallowed up in the will of God, being a learner, being willing to receive instruction and correction from the Lord, and being set apart, not defiled by the world, 
but set apart for service to the Lord. Three things. How do you score? If you were to take an inventory in your life, do you have the heart of a servant? Do you have the heart of a learner? Do you have a heart of holiness? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and your goodness, Lord. We thank you that, that you love us. Thank you that you've given us an opportunity to serve you and to be a part of the work that you're doing, Lord. We thank you that we have an opportunity to learn from you. We thank you that through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, when you died on the cross, that you gave us the opportunity to be cleansed and be forgiven and to live a life of holiness. And I pray for each one here that we would be able to walk in those three things. We pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Listen, guys, before I forget, um, I have a little table out there, and I have a little email sign-up sheet if, um, if you want to keep up to date with the ministry. And um, I have a couple little bottles of hot sauce from Belize back there. It's the absolute best hot sauce in the whole world. So um, you can get one if you want, but you have to remember to pray for us every time you sprinkle it. So anyway, thanks for having me. couple quick things. First of all, um, why don't we just bring the lights to half-mast again, and let's all just stand to our feet. I love that message. I got a double dose of that today because I need a double dose of these things. You know, it's important to remember, I think, even as, as Pastor Joel just prayed, you know, asking for help from the Lord to do what His Word says to do, right? Sometimes we get caught up in that like cultural trap where we come to church to get beat up. Like, okay. And then like we go our way thinking like that was our Christian duty or something. Like I got beat up and I feel pretty bad and now I'm going to go, you know, back to my life and, you know, whatever. Try my best or whatever the case may be. And so how important it is for us to just remember and recognize and rehearse like when your kids come to you and, and you're going through, you know, the stages of correction and discipline and training and kind of all these things. And there's, you know, confession and restoration, restitution, whatever. But then you pray with them and you say, okay, Lord, this is what your word says. And, and will you help us to do what your word says to do? Will you help us to be the people that you've saved us to be? And so rather than get, you know, overly dramatic in these kinds of things, we're all going to stand and we're all going to pray that the Lord would just help us. And I encourage you just to, as the Holy Spirit's spoken to you today, as he's, you know, just placed that, what the Bible calls that heavy hand on your heart, you're just kind of feeling that, okay, you know, I'm, I'm convicted in this area or about this particular thing, or Lord, I, I'm just beating my chest because I'm a sinful man. Let's cry out to the Lord. Father, we do pray for just a work of your grace this morning. I am so thankful for such... Lord, just productive. Lord, surgical precision. That's how your word went out today. Wonderfully, Lord, applicable and relevant and just perfect in so many ways. Just what we need to hear. You've prepared for us. Lord, just as the prophets of old would give the word of the Lord, you've given us a word from the Lord today. Lord, and we want to do all that you've told us to do, but we do not have the ability, God, to to grow spiritually, to live faithfully, God, and all the things, Lord, we talked about today, those three things. So help us, God. That's what we're praying. Our desire is for you. Our expectation is just set on you, God. We're going to ask and we're going to receive in faith and we're going to go our way, uh, committing ourselves to practicing these things. Lord, hear the cries of your people, Lord. We just want to just amplify the pleading prayers, God, that just come from our heart of hearts. Hear us as we ask for help, Lord. Holiness, God, help me to be holy. To make a covenant with my hands and feet and my eyes and my mind, to not go there, to not look at this, to turn away, to deal drastically with this sin. Lord, to cast off pride. And if I feel Lord, this self-glorying spirit come upon me. God, help me to scrub some toilets. 
Lord, to engage in service. Or to be teachable, to receive instruction, to live, God, for the uh, blessing and, and preservation, Lord, of others. Thank you, Father. Help us as we cry out to you. Thank you that you hear us and thank you that you'll do that work. Lord, help we husbands, help we fathers and mothers and wives, God. All of us together just to uh, pursue you, honor you in light of all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of glorifying your name, upholding your name in front of others this week. Give us opportunity, Lord. We pray that we could pass on something from this uh, wonderful study today. We pray that uh, as you give us opportunity, we'd see it and take it to preach your gospel, Lord, to plant the seed of your word in the hearts of those who need to hear. God, we're thankful to live in such a, uh, God, it's tumultuous. It's um, just ever upside down, Lord, our culture and society and all these things, and yet You're creating so much opportunity. People are asking questions and they want to know what the Bible says and what the gospel is all about. God, give us an answer and help us to seek and share that answer, Lord, as you've given it to us, to those who want to know. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen. amen. Two quick things and we'll go our way. Thank you for your patience. First, as Pastor Joel said, he'll be out there in the foyer field questions, sign up for his newsletter, encourage you to bless him. We support he and his family monthly, but it's not a whole lot, so you can do that on your own. You can also give him an offering today. I really encourage you to do that if it's a blessing to you. Slap some, you know, Pentecostal handshake, slap him some, you know, I don't know how that works, but uh, you know.